Good morning, church family. It is good to see half of your smiling faces today. Is that a bad joke? No, probably. All right. It is so good to be with you all this morning. It is good to be in fellowship and to worship with you today. I wanted to give you a few announcements for all the things that are going on as we begin to restart the fall semester. Lord willing, should everything go well, we should be back on September 13th with Awana and with Sunday School and Adult Bible Studies. So I hope that you're able to make it out for that. But if you are a guest today, we are thankful that you're here. We hope that you'll be able to connect with us using the Connect card that is in the seat back in front of you. We also have a church app that you can download to your smartphone, and you can use that to send in prayer requests, to look at sermons, and to connect with us there. I've got a few different announcements for you, like I said, concerning all the things going on in the weeks. So there is going to be an Engage Pink on August 26th, that's a Saturday. Can you hear me well? Oh, uh-oh. It sounds like it's pretty good. So, Engage Picnic, I'll make sure I speak loudly. That is happening on August 29th. That's a Saturday. That is happening at 1030 in the morning, or at least that's when it's starting. The entire family of those engaged students, you are welcome to come. So if you're interested in joining us that day, please sign up on the sign-up sheet in the Worship Center foyer. You can put down your name, how many people are coming, and whether or not you're bringing a side or a dessert. We'll have burgers and hot dogs and drinks available for that day. We also have a business meeting on Wednesday, September 2nd at 6.15 here in the Worship Center. So if you are a member, please plan on coming to that meeting. We have some very important things to talk about. We need a quorum to make decisions, so please mark that down on your calendar. We need you to be there. And then finally, you may have seen as you were walking in some clipboards uh, sitting next to the doors uh, to the entrance here. So those clipboards are for kids who are around the nursery age, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, around those ages. Those clipboards have some coloring sheets, some pencils, some paper for you to, uh, for them to utilize them to use during the sermon so that they are able to just stay focused and enjoy themselves during the service. So that is all the announcements for today. Questions, of course, you are free to ask any one of the staff members, and we will be happy to help you out. Begin today, let's pray, and then we'll begin our service. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love for us. I pray that you be honored and glorified in all that we do. Lord, in the songs that we sing, in our listening and hearing the word, I pray that we would tune our hearts to yours, that we'd seek your will for our lives, that we would see your character and your mercy in the word and in the songs that we sing, and we would give you praise and honor and glory for what we are seeing today. I pray that we would walk out of this sanctuary changed and that our lives this week would be a reflection of your life and your character. We love you, God. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Jason. Amen. Let's stand together. <laughs> Like this. 
to be. It reminds us that we are on a journey in this faith walk. 
with the Lord, that life is a journey, and progress, and growth, and maturity, strength, all of those things are part of God's plan as we walk through this life with him and together. Thank you for being together today. Thank you for being present, uh, either in person or online. Thank you for uh, tuning in. You have a lot of different ways to invest your time these days, and you have a lot of time these days, I'm sure. So thank you for being part. Uh, there is an outline available to you in the bulletin. There's also one available in the church app if you'd like to follow along and take notes that way. Would you uh, bow with me in prayer as we uh, begin this morning? Father, thank you that we get to participate in the joy of redemption. That we can sing songs that profess the fulfillment we get in being the redeemed. I thank you, Lord, for the shed blood that made our redemption possible. I thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we lift you proudly and boldly today as the Lord over this place. Let your glory fill this place. I pray, Lord, that the preaching of your word would be accompanied by the power of your Holy Spirit and that it would be true to your word, Father, that you would give insight that goes far beyond our, our basic human understanding, Lord, that you would plant within our hearts and in our minds seeds that will blossom and grow into fruit and that in Christian maturity we would be the ambassadors of the gospel message to this world that you have called us to be in this 21st century. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of fellowship. We pray that you would protect it, that you would uh, keep us in security and in health and in unity. And God, along the way, we will sing your praises. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So my question for you this morning is this as we begin time in God's Word. Have you ever been confronted with overwhelming evidence that forced you to realign some aspect of your thinking or your belief? Overwhelming evidence that said, oh, what I thought, what I assumed isn't reality. I have come out of many a test in my time as a student, realizing that I didn't know as much as I thought I did about that subject about which I was being tested. Have you ever bought something and thought you got a really good deal and then you realize after the fact that, oh, I did not get the deal that I thought I had gotten? It stings, doesn't it? Yeah, it stings. Maybe, maybe you got some test results, uh, maybe uh, blood work, health tests, and you realized, oh, there's, there's a health issue I've got to deal with here. I wasn't as healthy as I thought I was. Maybe you have overheard people saying things, people that you thought were trusted friends and confidants, and you've overheard conversation, and you realize, oh, I have assumed things about our relationship that aren't true. Or maybe you've had a birthday, and you've had to come to terms with the fact that you are no longer qualified as a young adult anymore, or even as a middle-aged adult anymore. Maybe in being confronted with the reality of the passing days and months and years, you've had to say, wow, time's running out, time's changing. Those things can shake us when we're confronted with things that overturn the apple cart of our understanding. It is a difficult and necessary aspect of life that we enthusiastically participate in the ongoing work of uncovering, discovering the truth, and living in that truth. And sometimes it's in very small things, like the ones I've talked about this morning. Other times, it's in the big things, the really big things, the things that we build our lives on, our worldview on. This week and next week, I'm going to be talking to you and, and preaching from God's Word about what it means to be convinced why we are convinced. We're going to be thinking today about being convinced. Next week, we'll be thinking about staying convinced. 
We're going to be exploring reasons to question, reasons to doubt, reasons to believe. We're going to deal with these things honestly. This is going to be an honest conversation about these things because the church shouldn't be a place where we come in and we all put on uh, a, a veil or an enamel of, of rock-solid Christian faith where we all have it together and we're never shaken, we never doubt, we never question, everything's just peachy keen. We're not here to fool one another and we certainly can't fool God. So when we come in and we are wrestling or we are struggling, we are in good fellowship. And when we come in and we, were on, we are on cloud nine and things are going great and, and, our, and our faith has never been stronger and, and we are overjoyed and testifying and praising, then we are also in good fellowship. The church is not a place where we have to try to convince one another. And we certainly can't convince God because, again, he knows our heart. So we're going to have an honest conversation about these things and probably some others. This week, we're thinking about being convinced, what that means to be convinced, what that looks like to be convinced, the struggles that we have along the way in being convinced. Because I, I would venture a guess, and it's only a guess, that we oftentimes are not as together as we want people to think that we are. What does it mean to be convinced? It's a feeling of strong certainty or conviction. What does it mean to doubt? It's a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. We often think of these things as being diametrically opposed. If you are convinced, then you no longer have doubt. And if you, and if you, if you have doubt, then you can't be convinced. I want to challenge that assumption, particularly when it comes to the Christian worldview, being a follower of Jesus Christ. Because you should be a convinced follower of Christ, but that doesn't mean along the way that as you are stretched and as you are grown that you don't find yourself challenged in areas you didn't think that you would be challenged in. Believers and unbelievers alike have to deal with doubt. Every worldview is going to be brought into question at some point along the way. And I am so thankful that the Christian worldview can stand the test. And we're going to explore how it does in this week and the week ahead. Different causes come along to make us doubt. Sometimes it's because our roots are very shallow in our belief. If we are not grounded and grounded deep in what God's word says and in who he is and our relationship with him, then yes, we should expect to be buffeted by the storms of life and, and maybe be tip toppled over if we're not grounded in him. So sometimes shallow belief or, or lack of depth to our faith can be a reason that we, that we struggle in doubt. Sometimes we don't understand the cost that comes with this journey. I, I suspect that the cost is going to become weightier in the days ahead rather than lighter for publicly saying, I am a follower of Christ. I believe in absolute truth. I believe in, a, in an unshakable standing moral foundation that God established, that we are called to uphold. And all the things that we hold as virtues and values in this country, like liberty and justice and, and, and mercy and grace, that all those things are built on that foundation given by God. I suspect that the cost for identifying with our Savior will be higher in the days ahead. I think God's word uh, paints a picture of that in the last days. Sometimes unexpected challenges come our way and they, and they shake our faith. And in that particular area, my heart for you as your pastor is that you would be as protected as you possibly can. That we would be anticipating attacks that would come our way and be diving into the foundation of our faith and saying, well, how do I answer that question? Why do I believe this to be true? We should be men and women who are, who are advancing because there is no stalling in our sanctification, in our becoming more like Christ, in our growth. We have to be growing or we will be regressing. The outworking of doubt if we are not ready for it, is that we can be devastated if we're not prepared. If we are prepared, it can be an incredible catalyst for growth. We need to face doubt. Do not bury it. I mean that. Face your doubt. Do not bury it and ignore it. You say, what do you mean? There's this undefended, unguarded place in my, in my understanding of who God is or what his word says. And I, and, I, and I haven't been able to reconcile it. And I don't want to tell anybody about it because I'm afraid to talk about it. 
Do not do that. Christian fellowship is a place for us to say, I don't, I need, I don't understand what God's saying here. I don't understand why it is this way. I hope that your Sunday school classes and your small groups and discussions in your family revolve around not only the amazing, life-changing, edifying testimonies of what God is doing, but also the things that you're like, I don't get this. Face your doubts. Do not bury it. Because the more we bury it, the more we give Satan a foothold to, to throw it in our faces and say, none of this is true. You're living a lie. God is big enough to handle my doubt and your doubt. It's not going to scare him. Being convinced does not mean that all questions and all struggles have ceased. I wish it did. I wish that when we were convinced, when we gave our lives to the Lord, that we would enter into this place of just total perfect security where we never second guess, where we never, and in God's power, if we were perfect, we could live that way. But the old nature struggles and resists and goes fighting. And throughout this life, we have to choose to put God on the throne and kick ourselves off of the throne. And it's hard. It's difficult. It's easier in community to win that fight. It is very difficult in isolation to make it through with a faith that's intact. The Apostle Paul was a man who was convinced of that, I have no doubt. Did he struggle? Yeah, he struggled. We see it in the Word. We see it in the letters that he wrote. I want to consider for a moment his hardships in view of his Roman ministry at the end of the book of Acts. I want us to think about hardship as it comes to bear in our faith, because so much of doubt that comes our way in the Christian life is because of hardship. And it may be, just, just maybe, that you can identify with some of that in 2020. Questions that have arisen that you never thought you'd ask. Things you're wondering but you don't want to talk about. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 28. We're going to be looking at verses 17 to 31. It would be wrong for me to read this text and preach it to you and not give you any context for what's going on here because there's a lot going on here. So let me paint a picture for you. After Paul's third missionary journey, late 50s, early 60s AD is when this is happening, he was taken into custody. He had been preaching in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a riot. He was taken into custody, and that landed him uh, in this two-year limbo of uh, after he appealed to Caesar. So for two years, he's waiting to, 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 to go and, and stand before Caesar and have his trial. He's under house arrest. Uh, he's got guards. He's got manacles. But he's allowed, he's allowed visitors, even as a prisoner. He's allowed to have visitors. And this is a, this is a really big deal in Paul's life because he had a, a deep and expressed goal of wanting to go to Rome, the capital of the entire empire, and preach there to minister to the, to the Jews in Rome so that they could hear the gospel. He expresses this in Acts 19 in Romans chapter 1. He says he wants to go there. Two years he waited from the time he was arrested. arrested to finally get to be transported to Rome. He was shipwrecked along the way, had, a, had an interlude in Malta. If you want to read about that, it's in the book of Acts. This is a very productive time in Paul's life. He wrote Philemon, he wrote Colossians, he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Philippians during this two-year house arrest. His purpose was to go and to share the gospel, but he could not have imagined how God would orchestrate it in shackles. It's not the way he would have wanted it. He was illegally arrested. Just his, the trials were shams. He was in confinement. He was shipwrecked. And here he is. He finally lands in Rome. And, and he's going to be there for two more years, by the way. So four years of his life are tied up in this that none of us would have wanted. But God said, Paul, I've, I've got a purpose for you in this, and I want you to go, and I want you to preach, and I want you to teach. And yes, you're going to struggle. We're going to look at both Paul and those he ministered to for a few moments this morning in view of this question of being convinced. So, having given the setup, if you would, turn your eyes to Acts 28, beginning in verse 17. It's a lengthy passage. I'm going to move quickly through it. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people, or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. 
When they examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Again, Paul was a Roman citizen. He could do that. Though I had no charge to bring against my nation. Verse 20. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you. Since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you. And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you and what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everyone, uh, that everyone, uh, everywhere, excuse me, it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came uh, at, to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning until evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Verse 24, and some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing amongst themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. This is what ticked them off. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, and he welcomed all who came to him, Paul. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. I'm so thankful that Dr. Luke was inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen this really important record of what Paul's ministry was in Rome because we can glean so much from it. And Luke being a doctor, he gave us all the details that he could in the space that he was very meticulous as much as he had room to do it, he gave us the details that we needed to know. Look at the occasion and the opportunity of Paul's ministry here. He wanted to, in verse 17, explain that what he was getting ready to share with him wasn't an indictment against his heritage or against his people or against his nation. He was qualifying what he was about to say to them. He wanted them to know that he was innocent, but nonetheless he was there because God had a purpose in it. It's not that he was guilty, he was innocent, but there was a higher purpose at work. He was a prisoner, he says, on behalf of his nation. And he says that, in fact, the hope of Israel is why he's a prisoner. He's talking about Jesus there as the hope of Israel in verse 20. I think it's in verse 17, it's interesting, if you, if you try to figure out, well, what's Paul's aim here? He's trying to assess whether or not they're, they're hostile or they're supportive because these local leaders, and that's who they were, they would have been local synagogue leaders that were coming to check out Paul. He, wanted, he, he knew that they probably had connections to the imperial court and that they would be people of influence. And he wanted to know where he stood with them because God sent them there to preach and teach. Are these gonna, are these gonna be allies or are they gonna be opposition in me trying to convince, Paul trying to convince the Jewish uh, people living in Rome that Christ has come and that he is the Messiah. I love his, his shrewd word choice in verse 17. Notice that he says, brothers, and he draws this distinction, right? He, 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 was, he was delivered as a prisoner by these other people. He draws this a distinction between them and the Jews who, who objected, who rose against him. He's not lumping them all together. Look at what Paul learned here in verses 21 and 22. He learned that, that there hadn't been any communication of slander, essentially, against him that had come from Judea. I'm sure of that he was very thankful, that his, his reputation had not preceded him. How, how many of you have ever been to a place where you're thankful that your reputation did not precede you? Right? I was talking with uh, a dear friend this morning about the opportunity uh, that, that being transplanted affords one to start over. Right? Paul is thankful that, that they, the rumor mill hasn't hit, at least to his knowledge, them and poisoned their receptivity to the gospel. They are interested in what he has to say. Now, why does the text tell us they're interested? Well, in part, it's because at least uh, we know because they had heard a bunch of buzz about this, this new sect. It would have been called the way when they heard about it, the way. It comes out of Jesus calling himself the way, the truth, and the life. 
They've heard about this new sect, and the gossip and the buzz about that has given them interest. Paul had just dealt with this in Acts chapter 17 in Athens. They said, come back, we want to hear more from you. Paul often was told that, come back, we want to hear more from you. So he invited them back. Now understand that neither Paul nor his audience here was expecting this to happen. Paul, Paul wasn't looking to be in Rome under these circumstances. He didn't know it was going to happen this way. And, and moreover, these synagogue leaders, they're, they're in a very, without getting into the history of it too much, they're in a very tight situation in Rome because things have not been as favorable to them in recent times as they had been prior. And now this, this learned uh, teacher who has a lot of credentials behind him is coming and, and word's gotten out that, that he's ticked off the authorities, the religious ruling leaders uh, in, in their homeland in Judea. And he's showing up with this new message and they're in this position of, well, what do we do? Their whole worldview is about to be challenged. At some point in your life prior to coming to Christ, your worldview was challenged. And you had to decide, am, am I I right or wrong in, in what I'm believing and in the way I'm living. Assurance. Here's my point. Assurance does not preclude the unexpected from occurring. Just because we have the assurance that, that we belong to the Lord and he has saved us. And if you have given your life to him, then you should have the assurance of salvation. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand. But this doesn't mean that the unexpected doesn't come our way. Where we are knocked off kilter and we have to say, wait a minute. What am I supposed to do in this situation? God is no, not afraid to overturn uh, the, uh, the apple cart or rock our existential boat, if you will, to shake us in our beliefs, to shake us in our unbelief. And, and both groups in view here had to deal with some unexpected things. Paul had years to think about what God was doing here. And he was doing worthwhile work. What did Paul do? Well, look at verse 23. He labored all day to explain preach and teach. He shared the gospel with Roman synagogue leaders in the capital of the power that ruled the world at the time. What a missions opportunity he had. What a challenge it must have been. He expounded, he testified, he convinced. What does that mean? He unpacked the word to them. He, he shared, when I think it says that he testified to the kingdom of God, <clears throat> that isn't just broad, the broad theological generalization. I think Paul's telling them about his conversion experience. How the king of the kingdom called him out and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul had a testimony. He tried to convince them to overcome their doubt. He addressed their questions, and he tried to make his case. And the result, not surprisingly, was that it was mixed. It was mixed. Some were persuaded, some were not. You say, well, why does that happen? Why does that happen? Well, the Bible talks about our hearts being like soil. Sometimes it's fertile and tilled and ready for the truth to be planted, and other times not so much. There are different responses to the gospel because people are in different places in their life and there's different levels of willingness to hear something that challenges what was assumed. There was disagreement that broke out, it says, amongst them. Truth is divisive. Every time that you and I present the gospel to someone, we're telling them by definition that, that the truth that they believe that's converse to it is, is not true. It's a lie. It's wrong. If Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, then that means that there is no other way, truth, or life. That's offensive. That's absolute. But truth by definition is offensive. But truth by definition is exclusive. If it's true, then the opposite can't be true. Why did he quote Isaiah to them? Did he not know that it was going to tick them off? Do you know what God did 700, excuse me, 700 years prior? He told Isaiah the prophet, I'm sending you to a mission field of, of my people, and they're not going to believe you. They're going to, they're going, their hearts are going to be hardened by the message that I'm giving you. And that ultimately the message is going to go to the Gentiles. Paul wants to tell these, these Roman Jews that 700 years prior, those who would reject him, God said it was going to happen. He's trying to make a case that they shouldn't behave that way, to think about what God said. He's not trying to chastise them or beat them with it. He's trying to soften their hearts. He wants them to understand that the Gentiles are, in fact, part of God's plan. Now, I want to address something that maybe you've observed already in the text. 
And uh, maybe, maybe you have them. Verse 29 is missing in most of your Bibles. There's a reason for that. There are two families of ancient texts, Byzantine and Alexandrian. The, most, the earliest ones don't have verse 29. So I did not skip it. I am not trying to manipulate God's word. It is not believed to be an original verse in the text. And what it said is that, uh, that, that people departed and they had increased reasoning. We think that it was added 400 years later uh, after this happened because they were trying to make a segue into verse 30. Somebody added it in the text along the way. I don't want to get distracted by that, but I wanted to address it because I wanted to be honest with you. There is no verse 29 in Acts 28. Some translations have it, some don't. The King James and some, some, uh, some translations are based on one family of texts. Uh, other translations are based on the other family of texts, Alexandrian and Byzantine. It's a long story. They teach you all about it in seminary, and it just makes you want to cry sometimes. <laughs> Here's the point. The truth can be difficult to grasp, and we see that in Paul's apologetic outreach to these synagogue leaders. It can be hard. We can, we can receive it with childlike faith, and then we start to get into the depth of what God's teaching us, and he wants to mature us, and we struggle with it. And, and for me, I'll be honest with you, sometimes that struggle is because I want my way, I want my reality to be the way, or I want to be comforted. I don't want to be shaken in what I always thought was true, and now I realize that isn't true, isn't true the way I thought it was. That's called the, the, the fear of sunk costs. If you've invested time and energy into an idea and you realize that idea wasn't true, <clears throat> I don't want to let go because I'm used to it being this way. For hundreds and hundreds of years, these Jewish leaders were rightly taught that they were God's people and that God had a plan and a purpose for them. And now they're hearing that God has sent his Messiah and the Messiah has given his life for them. And it didn't play out the way they thought it was going to play out. And now they've got to choose to accept or reject. Paul didn't just preach to them once and then leave. It says he spent two years with them. Only by God's power could he do that. It says he, that, that he, he boldly and unhindered, without hindrance, gave the word to them. He endured. And the result was that he made an impact. If you know the, the outworking history of Paul's ministry and what happened in Rome in the course of time. God used the roads that Rome had built to be the evangelistic highways of the ancient world. God did a mighty work in sending his apostles to different places throughout that empire so that the, so that the seeds they planted would flourish. We're here today as, as bearers of that Christian heritage in part because God did that work so long ago using faithful men and women. There was a harvest, it was worthwhile. But it came at a cost. Paul made an impact in his obedience to God. It took time for him to be ready to do what he was going to do next. We think that what happened, uh, Luke doesn't tell us directly, but we get it from Paul's letters, that he eventually was released, uh, freed after two years. He, he had a, a desire to go uh, west toward what we would call Spain today, and then he he uh, preached the gospel some other places. He ended up being rearrested, and it was not a house arrest. It was a prison arrest. It was brutal. He was ultimately beheaded. He was a martyr because of his faith in Christ. Even now, as we look at this text, where, where this portion of Paul's life, he's being prepared for yet another thing that God's going to lead him into. It took time for Paul to ready others. It took time for Paul to be ready himself. There is much to be learned and to be put into practice if we're going to do this Jesus-following thing. And along the way, we will have insight and understanding and revelation. And God will say, now do you finally get it? And other times they'll say, I need to leverage doubt and make you question your assumption so that you can trust me in faith and walk with me further. God can use our doubt. Truth is a lifelong pursuit. Maybe you identify more with Paul in this passage. Maybe you identify more with the Jewish leaders. But regardless, being convinced, and I hope that you would say that you are a convinced follower of Christ, being convinced doesn't mean that all questions and struggles cease. It just doesn't. And the temptation is to bury our doubt in fear and to not face it. We must face it. We are called to be ambassadors of the truth, to be bearers of the light. 
And if we won't even deal with it in our own lives when darkness is, when we're struggling against it, how can we reach the world? We have to face it. Unresolved doubt will stall our Christian growth. It will. We don't hide it in shame. We discuss it with trusted, dear Christian friends and confidants and mentors. And we pray about it. And we wrestle in God's word. And we wait on the Lord to answer the questions. And sometimes he gives answers and sometimes he says, faith is enough. This isn't for you to know. There's a lot we don't know, a lot of questions we would love to have answers to, but we do have a lot of reasons to believe so many. This image, at least for me, conveys what my faith walk is like. I have my head and my heart. Sometimes the doubt and the struggles manifest in our, in our head intellectual questions about the world and about God and how can God be this and this and how can God be just, just head stuff. Other times our struggle is heart oriented. A lot of times pain and suffering and, and hardship, that's where the struggle, the doubt comes to bear in our heart. And sometimes as a Christian I feel like I'm trying to balance the pull of both of those and to walk the straight and narrow with my Lord. I identify with that image because it reminded me that a faith walk is not a sprint. You couldn't do that, that tightrope. You have to take it one step at a time. Yes, the pace increases from time to time. It slows from time to time. And I know God's word has the race metaphor in it, and, and, and I'm not challenging that at all. Far from it. I'm trying to illustrate that it, when, when it comes to our journey of belief, it's work. But wow, it's rewarding, church. It's so rewarding. I think that there may be a lot of walking wounded in the church of America today. So what are walking wounded? Walking wounded is a term that's used in the battlefield typically to describe people who are casualties. They're injured, but they're still able to get around. And it, would, it, would, it breaks my heart to think that there are walking wounded men and women boys and girls coming into church and wrestling with a thing, with a burden, with some sin thing in their life or some doubt or some struggle, and they will not share it. They will not trust anyone else with it because they don't want to be seen as weak. We are all weak. We are all broken in some way. Every one of us. God mends those broken bones. He bandages those wounds. How is your faith walk right now? Don't be ashamed for doubting. Be ashamed for doubting and not seeking the truth. Peter Abelard gave a lot during the Middle Ages to help us understand that you don't have to agree with all of his theology to appreciate his contribution to the Christian uh, worldview in his day. He said the beginning of wisdom is found in doubting, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. By doubting, we come to the question, and by seeking, we come upon the truth. I had to doubt my own ability to save myself, to be saved before I could accept the grace of Christ. You say, well, what about James chapter 1, which says that, that doubting is, 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 is wrong, that we shouldn't doubt. The very, that's verse 6 of James chapter 1. Verse 5 talks about going to God for truth and going to God for the answers. If we don't do that and we linger in doubt, yes, then we are wrong. But if we say to the God of the universe, Lord, I don't understand, I, I lack wisdom. This is the entire book of Proverbs. Lord, I lack wisdom. I'm bringing my doubt to you, my insufficiency to you, because I don't have the answers. That will drive us to the truth, because he is the truth. Stagnant faith is fertile soil for weeds and for doubt to grow. Why do I believe? Why do I believe? What convinces me? It's only fair that if I challenge you to be able to answer that question, that I would attempt to answer it myself as I bring this to a close this morning. A couple of things are, are what I would say the undergirding foundations of why I believe. General revelation, I, I, see, I see evidence of God in design. All around I see design in this universe. The, 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 the vastness of it, the scope of this universe, that not only not only the, 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 the bigness of the universe, but at, at the smallest detail level, the fact that there is, there is a, the mark of an intelligent creator everywhere we look, screams to me that this is not an accident. 
that there is more than just what we see and what we can comprehend with our senses, our physical senses. When it comes to special revelation, I think about the unified message of this book that was written over a very long period of time by so many different authors, and yet it has, it has a point. It has a revelation of God in view. It, it gets, it, when it comes to history, it gets history right. It's got tons of prophecy that was written before it happened. Daniel's visions alone are enough to convince most skeptics that something is going on with God's word. Just what Daniel saw and wrote. And I think about the way that God's word portrays accurately and completely the human condition and the world condition and, and, and why it is this way. No other book that claims to be a holy book can, can compare with God's word. I am convinced that man did not write this because man isn't capable of writing something like God's word. Even when we fight over whether or not verse 29 actually existed in Acts 28, the unifying overarching message is the same. God has protected and preserved it throughout history because we, we need it. That and so many other reasons are why I'm convinced, but that does not mean I do not doubt. I've been wrestling with a, with a, a thought for a couple of weeks. I've bounced it off a couple of people right now. I still haven't adequately gotten peace about it. But it's not causing me to abandon everything I believe or know. It's just something I hadn't thought about before. If you've come in here or if you have been coming here for a long time and you are struggling with lingering questions, you're in good company. Maybe if you've had recent things emerge, you're like, oh, mm, you're in good company. And maybe your faith is rock solid and you never question. I would say that you are in good company, but I'm also concerned for you. Because if, if we want, we can isolate ourselves from, from any input, any information, anything that would make us think and grow. And we can live in that little huddle, separated from the world, separated from the mission field, but we won't grow that way. God wants to grip us and mold us and mature us. And along the way, we will ask questions and he will give answers in his way and in his time. I want to challenge you to undertake the last resort of any stubborn man who goes to Ikea and buys a piece of furniture and takes it home. The last resort, every man has to, every man has to rely on is what? Reading the manual. Have you read? Are you reading the manual? It may just be that the thing that you're wrestling with, the questions that you have, God's already answered. There's a lot more in there than you just get on Sunday school in the morning and from a sermon on Sunday morning. Do not let your Sunday school teacher and your preacher be the only input of God's word that you get. I want to challenge you this morning as we stand in conclusion to this message. If you would go ahead and stand. I want to challenge you to think about reasons you believe. I'm not asking you to question your belief, but why you believe. Why do you believe? Are you able to share that with someone else? Paul had to be able to articulate to his Jewish audience why not only had he not abandoned his heritage, but he was a completed Jew, as they say today in the Messianic Jewish community. A completed Jew. What makes you a complete follower of Christ? Why do you believe? Would you bow with me? Father, I pray along the way, in our journey together, that we would be encouragers for one another, that we would point one another to the truth. Father, your word is truth. You are the embodiment of it. Pray, Father, that when the questions arise, when the struggles arise, when the things that life throws at us make us say, Lord, where are you? How do I explain this? God, that you would give us wisdom. You would give us courage. Lord, I pray for the one who may be present or, or, or listening, watching online, that doesn't have a relationship with you, that in these moments they would say, Lord, I, I want to know the truth. That's really what it comes down to. Do we want to live in the lies or do we want to know the truth? 
Father, I pray that they will call out to you, to the Savior who died to give them eternal life and ask for salvation. Lord, save me. I can't save myself. That's the prayer. Lord, give them the courage to pray. Today is a gift. Let us not waste it. Lord, I thank you that we have time in your word. Thank you that your word never fails to instruct and to equip. Let us be diligent in giving our time and devotion and study to your word so that we can be strong ourselves and ready to lift up the brother or sister who stumbles. But this is a worthwhile endeavor for your church. Lord, now as we enter into a time of praise, and singing and rejoicing, let us do it wholeheartedly, knowing that you are present and that you are smiling upon your people. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of
forsake us Father my prayer is that we will never forsake you that we will always glorify you and honor you Father we pray for peace in this world peace in our hearts love for each other and love for the world Lord, be with each and every one of us as we go through this, this year, this week, and this day. May we always glorify you. May others always see you through us. And Father, now we ask that you bless these tithes and these offerings, that they may be used for your glory of your kingdom. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. 